gospel this morning is taken from the 10th chapter of St. John, beginning with the 27th verse. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit receive the word. Some of us have been um, preparing for Easter through the Lenten season, following a series of meditations. And last night's meditation was, not my own will, O Father, but thy will be done. Not my own will, but thy will be done. And it got me to thinking as I was contemplating that last night about the quote that I just read in the gospel, the Father and I are one. Was the Father and I are one, not my will but thine be done. Almost the antithesis of non-duality. Right? It implies to the Father and I, too. Not my will, but thine, too, be done. Right? And that seems to be a reoccurring theme throughout the, the various Bible passages. There's a lot that points to that. And yet, we believe and know that the message that the Christ brought was a message of non-duality. Okay. So it got me to thinking what other examples of this problem exist in the, in the Testament. And I found a doozy. So you're going to have to bear with me and nobody bolt for the door or think that uh, you know it's time to start chucking things at me. It's going to make you uncomfortable and if it doesn't make you uncomfortable the way that it made me uncomfortable then maybe you do need to bolt for the door, I don't know. <clears throat> it's from the eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So if that, the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit 
is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Wow! Right? I don't even know where to start on some of that. Sinful flesh, God doesn't like us if we're in a physical body, there's no way to be good, there's, we're kind of the original sin concept filters through the whole thing, and, and, and it got me to thinking again, <laughs> and that was, Is this not very reminiscent of the Grimm's fairy tales? Isn't it reminiscent of the, the graphic over-the-topness of the moral teachings that were found in those? You didn't have to look very hard to find out what happened if you misbehaved. It was serious. You got eaten. You got turned into gingerbread. You got whatever it was. You, it was bad. Right? You didn't have to think about it. No. 2,000 years ago, Paul is talking to people who needed to be taught like children, like the Grimm's fairy tales. 2,000 years ago, it had to be slapped up the side of their heads and... So this is what it comes down to. There's a black and whiteness to it. Okay? Because you need a graphic example of what the approach is, what your options are. Now I know in different cultures and times preceding this 2,000 year period, different teachings were given to different people, and some of them were, had nothing to do with this, Advaita Vedanta has roots predating this by a good distance, but that's not who Jesus was talking to, this is not what he came to, this wasn't the, the reality of where the earth was at, at the point that, of the Incarnation. So Paul's talking to these people 2,000 years ago and says, look, you know when you're messing up. You know what it's like. You've been living with the Ten Commandments forever. The thou, thou shalt not. You know when you're lying and stealing and coveting and all that stuff. You know when you're murdering. And, right? You know what the lusts of the flesh are. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out. You know what it's like to be so hungry that when the food is presented to you, you gobble it up like any animal. Just <laughs> <clears throat> And everybody can get that. They understand their animal nature. And it didn't make, I'll bet, dollars to donuts. It didn't make anybody uncomfortable back then to hear this. They got it. They said, oh yeah, true that. <laughs> I'm a sinful person in a sinful body, and it doesn't behave the way I want it to. It leads me astray this way and that way and the other. I get that. How different it is 2,000 years later. 
because it makes us squirm and d discomfort because we we know that there's something else that's in our nature we're not just the animal we're not just the physical we can feel that it's part of the, the reality that we all now live with isn't that a wonderment we can actually point our finger to an example of evolution, of spiritual evolution. They might not be as earth-shattering as some of us would like, but it is progress. Okay. So now we're back to this question about non-duality and what do we do with it? Now that we've had this graphic example of, of how we are a dually minded person, that we're both <coughs> material and spiritual, what do we do with that? And so the, the lesson that Paul was trying to get through everybody's head was, well, keep mortifying the body, sort of like the sadhus, right? Ashes all over crazy lice and filled dreadlocks and, you know, emaciated and... Mortify the body. Deny it it's the things that it wants. And then keep your mind focused on that which you deem to be above. Okay. There's a new lesson in this for us. And the lesson has to do with what that last night's meditation was about. Not my will, but thine be done. When did he say that? What was the scene when he said that? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He could see before him what was coming. That he was going to have his body tortured. That he was going to be brought through the trials and tribulations. On, just on a physical level. And what that implied. And it wasn't like, oh, he's going to rise above that and it won't hurt. It had to hurt. It was mandatory that it would hurt in the way that it would bond the experience with the matter of earth. But beyond the physical discomforts, if we can call it that, was what he had to go through and knew he had to go through as part of this these next days, that he was going to be crucified bonded to the planet. He was going to take upon himself the karmic load of thousands of years and millions of people. And he was going to carry that with him to that cross. And we'll talk about that cross in a minute. And he was going to take that with him into the three days in the tomb. And he was going to experience the depths of the core of the planet in those three days and rise up through that, through the very matter of Earth, bringing with it, bringing with him all matter and all consciousness of separation. That's a tall order for one person to do, just on our own level. When we say we're going to go within, we're going to experience a deeper level of the birth of the Christ in us. We're going to bond with that. We're going to identify with that higher reality that happens at, at the winter solstice and Christmas. And then we're going to allow ourselves to have that penetrate deeper and shake loose everything that needs to be shook loose and raise up everything that needs to be raised up that hasn't yet 
gone on that journey. And it's discomforting. Can you imagine what it was like to know that that was coming for millions of people and thousands and thousands of years? So he said, Father, in his agony, Father, let this mission be taken from me. Understandably, right? But let this be taken from me. And then he says, however, not my will but thine be done. Not my will but thine be done. That was the beginning of his journey to the cross. The cross is not a punishment. The cross is not a mistake. The cross is not something that needs to be or should be avoided. Because it's in the affixing or nailing of spirit, your spirit, to matter, your matter, your physical body. that the dilemma of non-duality is resolved. That we begin then, then and only then, to understand what Christ consciousness is in form. Not a transcendental experience and then back to the nasty old body that's not quite getting with the program, but that we have a new body, a new heaven and a new earth, right? Bonded together, made into some new substance. And that is the new age. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what happens in the transmutation at the altar for the communion. And that's what happens in the transmutation at our own inner altar when we go and pray and let go and let the light transform and transmute our body and blood. So let us appreciate that journey and accept the grace that enables it to come to pass. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.